Hey, you guys from New Plastic, and today we'll get into how to properly work with Asus and AGX renders in After Effects. If you didn't watch the last video, I urge you to go watch it because I explain a lot of things that will help you understand better why things work the way they do in this video. Check out my latest pack. It's the biggest pack I ever made, 159 fully procedural and very realistic fabric materials for Octane and Cinema 4D. I've worked on this pack for months, examining in detail different types of fabrics. I'm super proud of it and excited about it. So if you want an infinite resolution, endlessly tileable and customizable fabric pack, go check it out on my Gumroad. It's also broken down into more specific smaller packs like apparel, satin, velvet, fuzzy, sheer, leather, and others that are cheaper if you don't need literally every single one of the materials. So hopefully everyone can enjoy it. Link in the description. Also, I got these sick enamel pins on the other Gumroad store. If you like them, you can go get them again link in the description if you want to support further check out the patreon or membership where you'll find cool perks like these project files and free products but mainly help me make more and better content for y'all follow me on instagram at ojang and also i just opened an instagram for the channel so go show some love uh, at brand new plastic it's pretty lonely there right now i'll slowly upload content there that fits the instagram reel more than these youtube video format uh, it's been a long time coming so yeah at brand new plastic on instagram subscribe share comment bell eat more fermented food let's go Okay, so I have this scene here with lots of foliage and wet surfaces and raindrops with a sunlight and an HDRI. You can see how it looks like in a live viewer. And right now we're viewing with the AGX look. This is how it looks like in Aces. We discussed the differences in one of the last tutorials, so check it out if you haven't. So this time we want to keep all the HDR information in the scene and render within the ACES space. So in the Octane render settings, we're going to keep buffer type at HDR 32 bit and change the color space to ACES CG. I added all these AOVs, so we got the denoised pass, refraction, transmission, uh, the noise but it won't render out, shadow, reflection direct, reflection indirect, both denoised, ambient pass, so only the HDRI, sunlight pass, uh, crypto mats, shaded normals, and the Z depth pass. I also added the beauty pass here to make the comparison easier. Check out my tutorial about AOVs to learn more about all of this. Uh, we're also going to render out the AGX version. So let me just delete this and duplicate these settings, which we'll use for the AGX render. Since AGX is not a whole color space, but just a render transform, all we need to do is keep the color space as linear sRGB. We're going to take all this linear information and use the AGX workflow to transform it correctly to sRGB in post. And just so we can see how limited exporting a tone map sRGB image can be in post compositing, let's render out both ACES and AGX with the look baked into a tone mapped image. I went over this in one of the last tutorials. For ACES, we can just choose the sRGB since the latest Octane is using C4D's native OCIO config file, so we don't need to add a config file like we used to. One last thing here, the render originally has this beautiful shallow depth of field that produces this nice bokeh and everything, but I'll render the image without it and add the blur in post. That's why I rendered the Z-Depth and like I mentioned in the Z-Depth tutorial, we need to make sure that in the render settings in the parameter section, we set info sampling mode to non-distributed without pixel filtering. All right, let's render all four images out and go to After Effects. And here we are after importing the four EXRs. Now, before anything, we'll click down here and make sure our project is set to 32-bit depth so we can utilize all the information in the files we exported. The working space is set to sRGB because that's going to be the color space we're going to end up exporting since most screens are displaying in sRGB and that linearized working space is checked. Another thing you want to do is click on your composition and in the view menu, make sure use display color management is checked. That will make sure you can see how After Effects is managing your color that is being displayed. There are other workflows that require this option to be turned off, but for this workflow, make sure this is turned on. Let's make a new composition with the Asus CG EXR, add the extractor plugin and select the beauty pass. First thing we need to do is tell After Effects that this file is an ACES color space. Now we can add the color management plugins here. 
which will work because the way After Effects processes plugins is from up to down. So it'll process the beauty pass extraction first and then the color transforms after. But it's better to create a separate adjustment layer for the color management uh, above the image layers. That way we can stack up all the different passes under it and it'll affect all of them. So to tell After Effects this is ACES, we're gonna need the Open Color IO plugin. You can download it for free from this website. I'll leave the link in the description. Over here you'll have the GitHub link, click on it, then click on the green code button, download the zip, extract the zip, place the extracted folder inside your After Effects plugin folder and restart the program. After applying the effect, you're going to have to click here and feed a custom config.ocio file. In Cinema 4D 2023 and Octane 2022, there's a built-in config file located in Program Files or your Applications folder. C4D resources, modules, C4D plugin, and OCIO folder. I made a copy of it and put it in my OCIO folder for better access. I think this is using ASUS 1.2. Select it, then in the input space, go to ASUS, then ASUS CG. And in the output space, go to ASUS, then invert ASUS 1.0 SDR. Now, if you use an older ASUS config file, in the input space, select ASUS, then ASUS CG. And in the output space, select output and sRGB. You're going to get the same results. It's just named differently. Okay. Now the image is still looking washed out and that's because the OCIO plugin told the image to convert the sRGB from ACES, which applies an sRGB transfer function that affects the brightness. But After Effects doesn't register that and it adds its own transfer function because it was told to display the image as sRGB in the beginning. It's stupid, but that's just how it is. I think they're going to fix it in the next After Effects versions, but we're still not there. So here we need to relinearize the curve that we added. To do that, we'll need to add a color profile converter effect. This effect is receiving an sRGB profile from the OCIO plugin. So we'll choose a sRGB in the input and we still want to output as sRGB, but we'll check the linearize output to remove that nonlinear transfer function. And great, now we're finally looking the same way we did in the Octane Live Viewer. If we try to compare the Live Viewer, you can kind of see it looks identical. Now let's compare this linear ASUS EXR to a tone mapped e ASUS EXR. Let's extract the beauty pass from it. And let me just turn on the Lumetri Lumascopes window so you can actually see the difference behind the curtain. The scope is set to HDR so we can see all the non-divisible data. And you can see that the tone mapped data is clamped at one. That's the brightest point in this image, full white. However, in the linear EXR, our brightest points end up almost at 100. There's just so much more information here, which can help us in many ways and holds the potential for this image to be played, not just on your average screen, but on HDR TVs and cinema projectors, for example. If I open the info tab, look at the numbers here while I hover on these bright points. The linear files RGB numbers give me 38, 40, 47, 28, but the tone mapped file just doesn't go over one. And by the way, just so we can quickly see how a PNG works, here's a PNG I rendered. I set it at 16-bit, linear, it doesn't matter. The PNG, as you can see, just can't hold all that information. So even though it might look the same as the EXR, you won't be able to further work on it because there's not enough information. And even though it can store information at 16 bits per channel, it stores it as integers and not floating points. So the data potential is still very, very limited, as you can see compared to the linear EXR. So and just a side note about PNGs. So let's paste the color profile converter to the tone mapped image. And now if I hide and unhide the tone mapped image, you can see they look identical. The linear image is clamped or tone mapped now, but that's after we apply the ACES transform on it. So it's remapping and conforming the data to SDR according to the ACES transform, which is what we want. What that means is that now we can do all of our color work before the ACES transform and work on the HDR file with a huge amount of data. And let me show you what I mean. You see, if I increase the exposure on the non tone mapped EXR, it's doing a beautiful job brightening up the highlights with no ugly saturation or highlight clipping happening. You can still see all of that foliage in the back. And if we under expose it, look how beautiful the highlights are staying nice and dominant. If we copy the same exposure effects to the tone mapped render, ew, highlights are gray. The whole image is getting darker at the same rate. And if I overexpose it, just no. This image is so burnt I could probably smoke it. Let me show you another insane difference. 
Let's duplicate the linear EXR, place it above the color correction layer and extract the Z depth out of it. Let's crank up the contrast on it a little bit, add another adjustment layer above the beauty pass and add my favorite depth of field blur by Frischluft. Let's display the depth buffer, nothing yet. So let's select our Z depth pass layer here and here select effects and masks and also invert it. Nice. Let's display the sharp zone, increase the blur and drag the focal point back till we land it on what we want to focus on. Perfect. Let's display the blur and ooh we check this insane bokeh effect. All these points here that have the brightness value over one are allowing the blur effect to explode them into a bokeh and not just blur them out regularly. If we use the same blur effect on the tone mapped image, nothing. We still get depth of field and it looks fine, but it's completely failing compared to the linear image blur. This is insane and should really show you how much you're losing if you're trying to do all this post comp work on pre tone map images. Okay, let's get rid of the Lumetric scopes, rename all these layers here and let's stack all the passes together. I'm going to fast forward this part because honestly, it's the same process I had in the other video I made about working with passes in After Effects. And I just want this video to focus on how to set up ACES and AGX and the importance of keeping everything in the linear HDR workflow. You can click on the top corner to um, check out a pretty old but still relevant tutorial. Okay, now let's duplicate this comp and replace all these linear images layers with the pre-tone mapped image layers so we can compare the difference. No need to replace the adjustment layers or the Z-depth and crypto masks since they are both identical in both cases. And let's remove the ACES conversion since we don't need it. And yuck. Yep, I think you get the point. All these changes require the invisible information to exist. And since we don't have that in the tone mapped version, we just get nasty highlights and chromatic clipping. Now, let me show you how you would do this for AGX. The pass blending process is the same. So we can just duplicate the main comp, select all the image layers except the crypto, Z depth and normal since they're identical in AGX and replace them with the linear AGX files. And bam, this looks cute, but it's inaccurate because our color management is treating these as ACES files. All we need to do is go to the open color IO plugin and replace the ACES config file with the AGX config file we dealt with in the AGX tutorial. Now in the input space, we'll select color spaces, linear BT709, which is the same as linear Rec709, which as I mentioned in the color management tutorial, Rec709 and sRGB share the same color gamut and pretty much the same white point. So linear BT709 is using a linear transfer function practically identical to a linear sRGB, which is the color space we render this image in. In the output space, we'll select appearance punch sRGB and bam. Now let's isolate the beauty and the color management layers only. And this is the exact image we saw on the Octane's live viewer with the AGX look. And again, if we replace all of these image files with the tone mapped AGX files, isolate the beauty and color management and remove the AGX transform since we don't need it for these. You can see they look identical. However, if we look at the lumetroscopes, the linear AGX files have much, much more data in them which will allow us to have the same level of compositing as we just saw in ACES. And as you can see, after grading, the linear looks great. The tone map makes me want to throw my computer out of my balcony. And if we compare the ACES and AGX looks, ACES obviously has a much higher contrast, which we can just crank up now on the AGX grading layer, maybe desaturate the sculpture a little bit as well. And yeah, we can get them both to look pretty close to each other, but they both have their own subtle differences. It's up to you to choose which one you prefer working with. And again, if I quickly replace all the passes with the PNG renders, as expected, you won't be able to blend everything to this extent without breaking the image. Okay, and finally, the cool thing is that we can now simply export all of these as JPEGs. We don't need to worry about color management on the export. We just hit render and you can see the images look identical to what we just saw in the program. So let's quickly go over how to do it in the newest After Effects update. Generally, it's a good approach by Adobe, but it has its pros and cons. So after importing the renders, I'll click down here again, 
but this time you see we have this added color management section. You can leave everything here like this if you still want to use the process I just showed you. But in this update, you can change the color engine to OCIO Color Managed. Hit OK and now you actually have these built-in Asus configs. They actually have Asus 1.3 which is great but since our renders are in 1.2 we'll select that. I tried to install 1.3 on Octane but honestly it was not as straightforward as the previous version so I'll need to figure out how to do it and I'll share it with you in a future quick tip. So once we chose 1.2, the working space automatically changes to Asus CG and the display space to Asus sRGB, which is great. We don't need to do anything. It's like that OCIO plugin we used earlier is just built in and automated inside the color settings of After Effects now. And straight out the box, we're looking identical to our live preview in Octane without the OCIO or the profile converter effects needed. If we try to add the depth of field blur, we're still getting this beautiful bokeh, which means After Effects knows to edit the file within the ACES space, but display it within the sRGB space. Okay, here's the AGX render, and the colors are not really right because After Effects is treating this like ACES. So let's click on the project color settings down here again. And this time in the OCIO config, we'll select custom and just choose the AGX config file from our computer. As you can see, the working space automatically changes to linear 709, which is good. But the display space, we need to change to sRGB appearance punchy like we had in Octane. And now we're looking pretty identical. There's a very subtle difference, almost like the live viewer has a slight more magenta tint to it. I'm not sure where it's coming from. Maybe I'm tripping. The funny thing is that now that the color space conversion is happening globally, you can't switch between different comps with different spaces. The Asus comp looks wrong because we switched After Effects to use AGX. It's not a huge deal because you're more likely to have all your renders in a project set to either AGX or Asus and not both. Anyway, cool. Now I can just stack up the passes and do the coloring work I want, same as we did before. And now here's something a little bit annoying. When you're done and want to export a JPEG, the output color space is for some reason set to be the input space of your original render, which is not meant for viewing, only for editing. So we're going to have to manually select the sRGB punchy appearance in the output space. And as you can see, they look the same. And if we change the space back to ACES and just quickly layer all the passes and do the same grading. If you want to export that as a JPEG, you're going to have to manually select the output sRGB which will look correct. The reason it's annoying is that you now have to do this every time you export. So to get around it, just make a template. In your render queue, click on this arrow in the output models and click make template. Give it a name, make sure it's set to JPEG. Then click on the edit button. Mm, okay, make sure it's JPEG. And in the color tab, change to the correct output space, which in this ACES case, it's output sRGB. Hit OK, OK. And that's it, you're good. Now in one click, you can save your JPEG in the correct way. And we'll make one for AGX as well. Name it, edit, make sure it's JPEG. And in the color tab, output space to sRGB punchy appearance. And that's it. Hopefully you learned something that can help your workflow. Uh, I know this can seem overwhelming, but it's really going to push your work to the next level if you're determined to get this right. Check out the procedural fabrics pack on my Gumroad. Check out the enamel pins. Uh, link in the description. Consider further support on Patreon and two kisses on the cheeks to all my Goombas, Yin and Gong, Gam Lopez, Dave Toro, Marie Robbins, Spoyas Chari, Eric Hu, Daniel Larry, Minky Kim, Hader, Leo, Peter Rodiger, Hyun Ji Shin, Chris Hyde, Alda Boyd, Farong Farong, Katie Royal, Derek Fredrickson, Vico Sun, Ruby Nine, Lucas Ranche, Tell Me More, Jaskirat Pendreth, Bori, Jin Kwan Wu, Eric Lofton, 3D Monkey Biz, Arlen, Suki Violet Su, The 22 Design, Joel Rieger, Adrian Desolé, Derek Schultz, Marie Sickendorf, Studi Image, Matus Jujuski, Blue Hamel, Mark Reagan, Joshua Akoi, Pongsukornim Siri, Webb, Kong Idiot, Maddie DeGueldre, Choi Yeonjun, NZE, IEMN, Golfino666, Ali Esser, Leandro Marimon, May, Baugasm, Shane, Harry Cooper, Hannah Kazaka, Oysen O'Brien, Joel Taylor, Faux Major, Kevin E. Quintero, Jeremy Bajana, Christina, Javola Tong, Yatsu, Rachel Villa, Ezekiel Grand, George, Alex Jean Yongcho, Matessa Arcozzi, Tequila Bedoya, Anur Koroglu, Takeyuki Chiba, Pablo Ritter, 
Sophia Wilton, David Hughes, Ramshad, Nick Davies, and everybody else on the list. Thank you so much. I love you. Have a great day. Peace.